Turn to John 19 with me tonight, please. John chapter 19. And verse number 16. Then delivered he him therefore to them to be crucified. They took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they'd crucified Jesus, took his garments, made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Note carefully verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he, saith he to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Father, bless your holy word tonight. Lord, give me unction to preach it, Father. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, I'd be able to stand before you and do what you've called me to do. And open the hearts of the people tonight to receive it, not as the word of men, but as it is the word of God. In thy name I pray, amen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course, record, every one of them, the crucifixion of Christ, because that's the ultimate, <clears throat> the ultimate story of why he's here. He came to bleed and to die. He was born to die. You die because you were born. There is a difference. He laid his life down. No one took it. He said, no one can take my life. So he gave it freely. The manner he chose, at one time they tried to cast him over a cliff. They tried to do away with him. They bound themselves into a, an oath to do away with him. But they couldn't do away with him because his hour had not yet come. When his hour did come, he went to the cross. The cross is cursed. Everything the Bible says that hangs upon a cross, cursed of God. Cursed is every one that hangeth upon a tree. Therefore he became cursed for you and cursed for me. The cross is a horrible thing. It's not a novelty. It's not the kind of thing that you'd like to stand by and observe. No matter how uh, jaded you might be and what it takes to excite your flesh, I would think that after a little while of observing someone suffering on a cross, you'd have enough and you'd want to leave. The cross at Calvary is something that none of us in this building tonight have ever seen physically. Fact is, for 2,000 years, no one has ever seen that cross. But 2,000 years ago, this event actually happened. This is an historical event. It happened in time and in place in Jerusalem. I want you to notice what the Bible says about that day. It says that there were those who were standing by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so before I came tonight, I thought I'm going to make a list of as many as I can find in the Bible who were standing by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were there. They were eyewitnesses. They saw with their own eyes the Lamb of God offer himself up for the sins of the world. 
First of all, I want you to notice in John 19, verse 25, we have some women mentioned. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When you read the other Gospels, you will find that there are at least five Marys at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there may be some duplication here, but from what I've seen by reading them, I simply took it on the surface of what it said. We have his mother, we have his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas. We have, mother, we have Mary the mother of Joseph and James. We have Mary the mother of Zebedee's children. Then we have Mary Magdalene. That gives us five Marys. We also have Salome and we have Joanna. That gives us uh, seven women according to the scripture. Now, no doubt there probably were other women standing around, but these were believers. These were people who had put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that meant that while he was hanging on the cross and all the enemies had gathered about him to gloat in his suffering, he saw some who loved him. He loved all of them, but here are those who loved him. That no doubt brought him a certain element of comfort because those who stood by that cross loved him. Now there was only one man, as far as the disciples were concerned, who stood there that day, and that was John the Apostle. The scripture says plainly the disciple whom Jesus loved. God had a love for John that was different than all the rest of them. And John was the only one who never doubted for a moment who it was. In other words, he didn't doubt that it was him that had betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. And who is it? Who's the one who did this? And John is the only one the Lord Jesus Christ said would see him as his coming. And he did in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 19, he saw the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ before John left this world. He saw that. None of the rest of them did. But John was privileged to see that. So here we have seven women who comforted the Lord Jesus Christ. All the disciples, all the apostles had fled for fear of the Jews and were hiding away. So this gives these seven women courage. They weren't afraid to stand in front of the, in front of the council and the Sanhedrin and all the rest of them that had condemned him. These seven women stood there. They loved him and they wanted him to know they'd loved him. They wept over him and there they stood and with them John the Apostle. So that's a wonderful scene. He had comfort from some who loved him. Most of them hated him. Most of them had gathered together that day to get their pound of flesh, to see the blood flow. You know how gory it can be in the flesh. The flesh is never satisfied. And here they stood that day. Then we find in Matthew chapter number 27, another one who stood by the cross of Jesus, and he was a centurion. Now a centurion is a Roman soldier who has an officer who's an officer and has authority over a hundred men. So that makes him a reasonably high ranking authority. He has a hundred men under him. So that's why they call him a centurion. He's an officer. He therefore has responsibility and accountability. He has to answer to an officer above him, but he's also an officer in the sense that he knows what's going on. He's aware, he's conscious of what's happening around him. Any man who's qualified to be an officer certainly should be that. And he's, he's watching, he's observing. Now he's observing, he's seen the world turn dark. He has witnessed the earth as it shook. He's witnessed the vitriol as it flowed from the mouths of those who stood around and cursed the Lord Jesus, wagged their heads at him and made fun of him, mocked him while he hung on the tree. This Roman centurion no doubt was a, was a battle-hardened soldier. Rome was always at war with somebody, conquering territory. It was the Roman Empire. So therefore they went and took land from others. So this man no doubt, as Pontius Pilate was, who was also a soldier, was here in this day watching something happen before his eyes he'd never seen before. He watched a man as they mocked him and they made fun of him and they, they, and they reviled him and they ac accused him, accosted him with words, everything they could possibly do, yet he did not fire back at them. He watched him in grace when the Lord Jesus Christ graciously accepted all of that and bowed his head before the Father as the Lamb of God. He was giving himself for our sins. When he was reviled, he reviled not again, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 53. When they lashed out at him, he didn't lash out at them. It took the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit of God to die a death like that. For his flesh hurt just like my flesh. 
The Bible says he uses the terminology when they mocked him, they cast it in his teeth. Yet he did not fire back at them. He did not, he did not lash out at them. And this centurion didn't listen to the Sanhedrin. He didn't listen to the disciples. He listened to his heart. Did he watch this transpire before his eyes? And he said, surely this man was the son of God. A witness that came forth from the mouth of a Roman. And he no doubt became a believer that day. There are others who stood by and watched him die. But this centurion called him the son of God. John the Baptist called him the son of God when the Holy Spirit came down and lit upon him. He said he's the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist witnessed the heavens open and the power of God come down upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, that's the son of God. Nathaniel said he was the son of God because he was sitting under the tree. And the Lord Jesus Christ saw him there and said, I saw you under the tree. And Nathaniel said, surely you are the son of God. The Lord Jesus said back to Nathaniel, do you believe I'm the son of God? Because of that, you're going to see far greater things than what had happened to you there on the tree. Peter called him the son of God. When in John chapter number six, the disciples left him, many of the disciples, we have those same kind of disciples today. They follow the Lord Jesus Christ on a very superficial level. Their faith is a very superficial faith. It goes no deeper than how they can feel, what they feel for the moment. They're moved by their emotions. And these disciples had listened to him. They liked what he said. But then he began to get deep with them. And he said, except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part in me. And my, they turned and said, this is a hard saying. Who can receive it? And so they went away from him. Then he cast his eyes upon his disciples that stood by, the ones who'd been with him. And he looked at them and he said in his heart, I hope that you've learned something. Maybe something is deep inside your soul now. And he said to them, will you go away? And Simon Peter said, to whom shall we go? Where are we going to go? There's nowhere to go. Where are you going? So you got mad at God and you left the church and walked out there. Where are you going? So you got cold. You got your feelings hurt. Where are you going? There's nowhere to go. And Simon Peter said, to whom shall we go? Simon Peter could be very eloquent. Very, very eloquent. That's an eloquent word. To whom shall we go? That's a rhetorical answer, in other words. An answer that gives an answer. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He knew exactly who he was. John chapter number 6. Martha called him the Son of God. When he came to the tomb of Lazarus, her, she was heartbroken, and he told her plainly, he said, Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> she believed him. You either believe or you don't believe. You either do or you don't. And it's not an intellectual assent to a bunch of facts. From the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And so she said, you're the son of God. Martha did. John the apostle called him the son of God. He called him the son of God in his epistle. He called him the son of God in the book of Revelation. And he called him the son of God in the gospel of John. There's no doubt in John's mind who the Lord Jesus was. was. He said in the gospel of John, he said, these things are written. This book's written. All this stuff's written down so that you might believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the son of God. <laughs> Gabriel called him the son of God. This archangel is, came down to, from heaven and he spoke and he said, that holy thing, that holy thing will be called the Son of God. Gabriel called him the Son of God. Devils called him the Son of God. Did you know that? Do you know why they called him the Son of God? Because they know who he is. Devils live in a spirit world. They don't live in the world of the flesh like we do. They live in a spirit world, folks. And a good study for any of us is to take the New Testament and write down every occasion the Lord Jesus Christ confronted an evil spirit and find out what happened. In not a single time did the Lord ever back up. He confronted them face on and every single time they yielded to his authority and to his power. Amen. Do you know why? We know who you are, thou Holy One of God, the Son of God. They know it. They know a whole lot more than a lot of preachers in this country know. Paul called him the son of God in his epistles over and over and over again. The apostle Paul called the Lord Jesus Christ 
the Son of God. The writer of Hebrews called him the Son of God. Time and time and time again, the writer of Hebrews exalts and elevates the Lord Jesus Christ to the highest possible position. Hebrews is one of the most profound books in the New Testament and probably one of the most overlooked. And the book of Hebrews is a gold mine. It is rich. The book of Hebrews starts out in the very first chapter saying that he is the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person. And upholding all things, the Lord Jesus Christ came from glory down to this earth and he is the very God of gods because he is the express image of the almighty, eternal, invisible being. You can't say it any higher than the writer of Hebrews says it in chapter number 1, verses 1 and 2 of the book of Hebrews. So the centurion said he's the son of God. The soldiers though in Luke chapter number 23, verse 36, mocked him. They made fun of him the rank and the file. They mocked him along with the rest of them. I wonder what the part they had in it. I didn't know they had a dog in that fight. He hadn't broken any of their religious laws. They had none. Probably Mithra, Mithraism or whatever, along with the worship of the, of the uh, Pontifus Maximus back in Rome. They embraced millions and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of gods, whatever, believe in whatever gods you want to. As long as you elevate the Pontifus Maximus, the Caesar who becomes a god, elevate him. It's okay. We'll accept your religion. And the Christians refused to do that. The Christians absolutely would not elevate Caesar to that high exalted position. The Christian says there's just one God. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. And they paid for it with their lives. So these soldiers are mocking this day. They mocked alongside the Jews. They made fun of him. They cast it in his teeth. In the book of uh, Luke chapter number 23, and verse number 36, it says this, Luke 23, 36, And the soldiers mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. They didn't care who the king of the Jews was. There's just something about the mob mentality. Have you ever noticed it? You ever noticed the mob mentality? That people alone sometimes are civil, but when you get to the... A, 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 a bunch of mad dogs in a mob, they seem some people just lose all sense of it. And they join in and they, they go to the attack and they want to draw blood. And that happens in the church sometimes. It happens in life. It's sad. One of the sad things about humanity is the mob mentality. Seems like when somebody gets, is turned on, somebody's been turned against, that everybody else wants to jump on the bandwagon without finding out what's going on. And somebody's been accused, the rest of them begin to point fingers too. That's sad. The mob. The mob was there. The same howling mob that said, give us Barabbas. Said, crucify him. I wonder how many of those people had eaten his bread at the Sea of Galilee. 5,000 here, 5,000 there. That's a lot of people. I wonder how many of them had eaten. I wonder how many of them had watched him as he healed the sick, cast out devils. Or even there at the tomb of Lazarus and the widow of Nain's son and other places, uh, Jairus' daughter raised the dead. I wonder how many of them had witnessed these things and yet they were full ready to join in and crucify him. That's mob mentality. I've been there. I've seen it. I know what it's like. A spirit comes over people. It's unexplainable. But in any event, the soldiers, the soldiers mocked him. Matthew 27, verse 41, verses 41 through 43. You'll turn there with me tonight. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders mocked him. You see, the soldiers mocked him out of ignorance. They didn't know anything. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders did. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 41. The Word of God says this, Matthew 27, 41. Likewise also the chief priests mocked, mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. <coughs> Mockery making fun of him. There's not a, one of us in this house tonight when people start making fun of us that we rejoice in it. 
we get mad. They start tongue lashing you. Your flesh wants to reach out, and reach back, fight back. It's hard to let a tongue lash you and not want to fight back. But he didn't. But you see, these people should have known better. The, the soldiers you can overlook, they're just ignorant soldiers. But the chief priests, scribes, and the elders, no, no, these were learned people. They knew better. They knew better. Yet the Lord Jesus Christ accepted it as they stood by his cross. You said that was part of his suffering. That was part of the price he paid. He endured that. One of the reasons he endured it is so that when he sits at the right hand of the Father right now as our great high priest, he can minister to us, minister to us the grace of God that we need when we go through that. Amen. Tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So the chief priests and the scribes and elders mocked him. Matthew 27 verse 39 says this crowd joined in too. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. I tried to find a little help on wagging the head. I don't know if it's this or if it's this. I don't know. But they did some kind of a motion that in that day was offensive. It was in that culture at that time for them to do that. They didn't even have to say anything. For them to come by and wag their head at him, they were holding him in contempt. Contempt. He was, he was in a contemptuous situation with them. Not only did they mock him, make fun of him, but they had contempt for him. They, de they lowered him. They tried to tear him down as low as they possibly could. And they wagged their head. Now, my friend, that's, that's what they did to him. The passers-by did. Notice it said passers-by. You've got the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. You've got the soldiers. You've got the centurion. You've got the women. You've got the apostle John. You've got all these people standing around, but here are these who just pass by. See, according to, according to the scripture, he was crucified right outside the wall of Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem today, you'll go to the northern gate, which is called the Damascus Gate, because Damascus, Syria, lies directly north of Jerusalem. And outside that, you'll find what's called the Garden Tomb. And an Arab bus station, and right above it is a uh, hill. And I've showed you slides of it before. They call it Golgotha. All of that is in close proximity. And all of that is right outside of the present wall of Jerusalem. But the walls of Jerusalem have changed over time. But that road that goes to Damascus, through the Damascus Gate, through the northern gate of Jerusalem, was there for a specific reason. That's where they crucified people, right next to the road. They made it a public spectacle. They didn't take them off in some room somewhere and hide them and lock the door. They put them on the road. Why? Because the Romans wanted to get maximum effect. Crucifixion was to sh for shock value. The whole idea was, we want you to see this. This is what you're going to get if you mess with us. This is the way we deal with people who break the law or we don't like. And so they hung him on a cross right next to the road. So here they are. They're traveling the road, up and down the road. And they see him, the passers-by. Normally they would just look and maybe gawk a little bit and then go on. But no, they felt it necessary to mock him, spit at him, bring their accusations against him. Don't you think it's quite remarkable, folks, how that at the end of his life, the Lord Jesus Christ was hated so much? The world hated him. Yeah. Everybody hated him, except those who believed. Amen. And to this very day, the Jews in the Talmud have a lot of horrible things to say about the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of horrible things to say about him. And that's what they teach their children from generation to generation to generation. They teach their children that this man who hung on that cross 2,000 years ago. Now here's something too. I want to mention this while I'm at it. Don't ever go to a Jew 
Don't ever go, don't ever ask a Jew who's been trained in Judaism, who's been trained under a rabbi who has the Talmud. Don't ever bother to ask a Jew if he believes that Jesus Christ lived. He'll tell you in a heartbeat he lived. Because that for 2,000 years they fought it like you wouldn't believe. For 2,000 years the Jews have done everything in their power to deny that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now folks, if nothing else, that proves He was here 2,000 years ago. And so they try on the Talmud. They accuse Him of everything. And the reason they do, of course, is because they've rejected Him. They rejected Him because they had been raised not in the Bible, but in the Jews' religion. And the Jews' religion on this day when the Son of God was being crucified, to them was victor. They had nailed this male factor to the tree, this imposter, this liar, this deceiver, whatever the name they had for him, they nailed him to a cross. When I see him up there, I see the love of God. Amen. I see one receiving from God Almighty the wrath of God poured out on his soul, receiving from men hatred, accusations, vilification. But I see him in his heart. I see him in his heart bringing to fruition what had to be done, coming to the end of it all, sealing it with his testimony by his own blood. I see him coming to the point to where he made his final statement, I'm going to prove to you that I love you. And that was what Calvary was for. When he rose from the dead, he proved to them he was who he said he was. A lot of people have died. A lot of people have died martyrs' deaths. And had he not risen from the dead, he would have simply been a martyr, a well-meaning man who died for his cause. But when he rose from the dead on the third day, the Apostle Paul said in Romans, he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. That is what made the difference. And that is what they hate to this day, the Jew does. That is one of the reasons that the book, The Passover Plot, was written. The Passover Plot, of course, has the idea that Christ never died on the cross. He swooned, and they took His body down from the tree. He wasn't dead. Took Him off somewhere, and He revived and lived out His life, married Mary, Mary Magdalene, as Brown says, and, uh, and uh, made millions off of a, of a lying, deceitful book. And He married Mary Magdalene, and they had children, and He lived out to be an old man, died just like any other man. That's all He was, just a man. No, He wasn't. He's God Almighty. Amen. One day they'll give an account to Mary Magdalene. <laughs> Not only God, but her, from maligning her with such accusations. There's not one shred of evidence at all that Mary Magdalene had any other relationship with him than simply a believer. But now the Gnostic Gospels that were found at Nag Hammadi that were written in the first century after Christ, Gnostic Gospels. You know, you folks in Sunday school, you ought to know immediately what I'm talking about. When I mention the word Gnostic, it ought to raise a red flag and you ought to be beginning to put the dots together. The Gnostic Gospels teach that he had a relationship with Mary Magdalene that was not altogether moral, that was different. And uh, that's what they're teaching in those Gnostic Gospels. And so he gets a hold of junk like that Dan Brown, and he writes his book, and all the rest of the garbage that goes with it, and becomes a millionaire by feeding that kind of garbage into the minds and hearts of the people. And the problem is that we have a whole generation of young people coming up today, a whole generation. They've been taught anything at home. They have been taught zip at home, taught very little in their churches. And so when they get a hold of something like this, it's intriguing, it's interesting, because he talks about things that they've heard a little bit about. And then he has his thesis. He puts it all together and he presents it to them and they buy into it. And then of course when they do that, you know what they've done, don't you? And you know what he's done. He's set up a whole generation for the mark of the beast, for the Antichrist. A whole generation. And he became a millionaire. What do you think God Almighty is going to do with Dan Brown one day? You can sell your soul for money. You can make a choice tonight to give your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ and live as God wants you to live and have what God wants you to have. And when your days are finished on this earth, you can leave this earth in peace. 
And you can know that one day you'll stand before God and you won't be guilty of the blood of Christ. And you'll know that you've been born again. Or you can sell your soul and you'll get it here. You'll have it here. You'll have everything money can buy here. But when you die, and you will die, you'll go out into a Christless eternity and the terror that you face will be unbelievable. I don't want to be in his shoes. I wouldn't want to be in Dan Brown's shoes. If I saw that man tonight face to face, I'd say, Mr. Brown, you need to be born again. You are lost without God. You say you don't have any right to judge. The Bible's already judged him. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. Anyone who denigrates the Son of God, I don't care if you've got a big white robe on and a little white cap on top of your head. I don't care if you're the leader of your religion. I don't care who you are. You denigrate the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you are lost and going to hell. For He is the only way that you can be born again. I've told you before time and again, you can be messed up on eschatology. You can be messed, on church, messed up on church polity. You, can, you, you may not know zip about church history. You may not know most of the doctrines of the Bible. But you can still go to heaven if you get Jesus right. You can go to heaven if you get Him right. You don't get Him right, you can be right on everything else. Of course, that wouldn't really make much sense. But if you don't get Jesus right, you'll never go to heaven. Well, He's the only way into glory. So they passed by. And then finally, Luke 23, verse 35, the people. And I don't know how to make of the people, because I've already told you about the ones who stood by the cross of Jesus. I've told you about who was there. There's no way I could know. Who can know? And probably it's not necessary for us to know everyone that was there that day. But I do believe this. I do believe that every person that stood by the cross and watched Him die on that cross. Now, folks, that wouldn't have been that long a deal. How long did He hang on the cross? Six hours, six hours, nine in the morning, three in the afternoon. And from noon, from three o'clock noon until three in the afternoon, it was pitch dark. When he died, the earth shook. And the moment he died and the earth shook, the graves in Jerusalem opened. And they could walk by and look down into that grave and see their loved ones. And then when he came out of the grave, three days later, many of them came out of the graves and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. But for three days, the graves lay open and the dead body was exposed. And there's no doubt in my mind, if it had been your mama's body buried there and it had opened up like that and you couldn't do anything about it, no doubt in my mind, you've been camping out to make sure that no beast would come to that grave and drag your mama's body out. But then on that third day, if you saw your mama get up, and walk through the streets of Jerusalem. There's no way you could have missed it. He rose, they rise. His grave's open, theirs are open. I am the resurrection and the life, and they're alive, and they walk through the streets of Jerusalem. That's a, that's a profound thing. That's a one-time event. Never happened before, hadn't happened since. Walked through the streets of Jerusalem, Imagine that. How many of them? I don't have any idea. But after the resurrection of Christ, here are all these people walking in the streets of Jerusalem as a witness and testimony to the Son of God. Someone like him cannot die and be buried and rise again the third day without shaking this earth. Somebody like him, somebody as great as he is, he's God in flesh. There's no way that somebody like that can go through what he just went through and the suffering he endured and the three days in the tomb and come on the third day without God Almighty making a witness and testimony to this earth. That's my son. He witnessed to him when he was baptized. He witnessed to him when he was born. And he witnessed to him when he rose from the dead. And so he came out. I, might like, I like to believe sometimes that Pontius Pilate was somewhere and he glanced over toward that cross. And he felt a little sorrow, no doubt, because he knew that for envy the Jews had delivered Christ up. He knew that. He wasn't a fool. Pontius Pilate knew the politics involved, and he knew the Jews had delivered him up for envy. What do you mean envy? 
They couldn't do what he did. They didn't have the power he had. Yet they called themselves the sons of Abraham. So Pilate <coughs> probably glanced a few times over toward the cross. Barabbas may have. Barabbas bar Abbas, his name means son of his father. Barabbas probably witnessed a few times the crucifixion of Christ and thought to himself, man, I escaped that one. I could have been up there. Should have been up there. But you see, because they, because they condemned Christ and Pilate made the statement, he let him go free. Even before he died on the cross, people were being set free. He turned him loose. Barabbas. Nicodemus, no doubt, was somewhere. The one who came to Christ by night. No doubt. No doubt in my mind. Nicodemus had to be somewhere watching what was going on. The angels, sure they were. They were there. Unseen to the human eye, but they were there. The angels witnessed that day. The demons, oh, they were there. Oh, yeah. They were there. Judas wasn't there. Judas didn't make it, did he? He took the money and threw it down at their feet and said, I've betrayed the innocent blood, the innocent blood. They said, what's that to us? And he went out and he hanged himself. And there he hung in the, when that earth shook at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The tree he was hanging on collapsed. And Judas' body fell forward. He's already dead. But his body fell forward and, and was busted open on the rocks below. And his insides were literally busted out. So here lay one of the disciples, dead, when Christ came forth from the dead. But then there's one who understood what was happening. If none of the rest of them did, I think he did. You know who that was? Think about it for a minute. Think about it. He tried to get him to betray. He said, if thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. I'll offer you the kingdoms of the world. Satan's smarter than all the people that ever walked the face of the earth put together in one time. He's brilliant. And he knew when Christ finally went to the cross and died on the tree, he sealed his doom. If there was ever one who understood what the cross was about, it was Lucifer. The battle had been won. He was defeated, and he knew it. And this is why the Bible says in the book of Revelation, he says, He knoweth that he hath but a short time. You watch what happens with Satan after the crucifixion of Christ, and you'll notice it is always related to time in a sense. He's dealing with time. He knows his time is running out. He knew. He knew. It was over. He'd been defeated. He tried his best, but he couldn't stop him. The Bible said Christ set his face like a flint to go to the cross and give himself for us. I wasn't there in the flesh, but all I've got to do is close my eyes and get on my knees, and I can be there in my spirit and my soul. It is as fresh today as it was 2,000 years ago. The crucifixion of Christ will never live. It'll never die. It'll always be a moment in time that'll be in time forever. Why? Because it is the greatest moment in time. Amen. It is the greatest moment in time. It's when it's the greatest sacrifice that was ever given. These people had no idea 2,000 years ago how privileged they were to be standing there when Christ was crucified. Father, in thy name I pray. I believe your word I believe the prophecy of the book, and I believe you're coming again. Again tonight, Lord, I consecrate my life to thee. I give you my life. Heavenly Father, I can't give to you nearly as much as you've already given to me. Nowhere near. But in some small way tonight, in Jesus' name, I dedicate it and consecrate it to thee. Use it, Lord. Use it for the glory of God. And Father, tonight, if there be anyone in this house 
Heavenly Father, who've never known you, I pray they'll know you. There are those who want to walk closer to you. I pray they will tonight. There are those, Father, tonight who want to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They know that they need that filling. They need the power in their life, the unction, the anointing. I pray for them. In Jesus' name I pray. For his sake I ask it. And amen. Stand up and sing, brother. What are we